Why was there so much emphasis on nationalism and pan-Arabism? Well, nationalism, of course, it developed first, it is a natural thing um, that uh, the people of a certain area feel a certain bond among themselves. And this was, this became more sophisticated, more philosophized after contacting Europe and following the model of the nation state. But it began first regionally and geographically, especially in a country which has natural uh, borders, um, mountains or desert, like Egypt, like Iraq, like any country like this. Um, well, they feel that there is a bond of uh, neighborhood, of living in one home or one area and so on. Then it was, as I said, was philosophized after knowing about the, uh, the national state and the nationalism in uh, Europe in the 19th century. Um, here we had first this sort of geographic nationalism that every country live within its borders and it was the borders which were marked out by the colonial powers after independence because Syria, Lebanon, Palestine to a certain extent had certain unity administratively speaking under the Arabs uh, and under the Ottoman Empire um, there were no borders but uh, according to the uh, colonial uh, division and so on Syria, Lebanon, Palestine became and even Jordan became uh, four separate entities so there was an aspiration that these borders were false, were artificial, were just drawn by the French and the British because every country has its domination on its certain area, on a certain area. Um, North Africa, for example, Libya, Egypt, Egypt under the British, uh, Libya under the Italians uh, for some time. North Africa under the French, even the borders between Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco were very, very uh, harsh and because of the wishes of the colonial powers. So there was an aspiration that all these borders are artificial and uh, going with the attitude of nationalism, which was nurtured for a long time following Europe uh, and European nationalism and Western nationalism. So they said, let us go to Arab nationalism. All right, but the question is, did, did this nas these nationalistic movements benefit the general population spiritually, socially, materially? Well, I believe that um, to a certain extent, yes, they created a certain awareness of togetherness and of the other that the other who is next door to us, we are having the same destiny and we are living in the same boat. Uh, but in the same time, it didn't, it ignores the, the, his, the, 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 the deep roots of faith, of religion. And uh, sometimes the people felt split or felt uh, not nurtured enough by nationalism and by patriotism and they want this strong resource or this rich resource of faith uh, they feel that it is lacking it is missing and the leaders the secular leaders do not want to be involved in using this religious attitude because they insist on uh, their secular direction so uh, I don't think that it allowed a lot of corruption because, and it, this is a problem now in all the world, because it maintains secular face of government, you have corruption. When the Soviet Union got, and Eastern Europe got a sort of um, uh, release from uh, Marxism and the communism, what they are suffering now is corruption because you do not benefit from the complete or comprehensive guard 
of religion. You want to restrict religion to the individual practice, to the individual behavior. And accordingly, the social life and the political life became very poor. And they were deprived from the richness of the religious uh, nourishment and the religious uh, direction. So accordingly, there are political problems, there are social problems everywhere because of uh, depriving our collective life from the light and the guidance of God. What was the reaction uh, of citizens to uh, governments that were neither Islamic or, say, pro-Western liberal? Well, uh, I think now there is a general attitude that Muslim peoples want justice and they feel that democracy can bring justice to them if it is practiced by good people not corrupted people so they want a sort of amalgamation of a combination of a coordination with democracy as a political system and the Islamic values, because in Islam there is the principle of shura, the mutual consultation between the ruler and the people. And this can be interpreted into democracy, because democracy achieves this in a sort of practical mechani mechanism. And it was inaccurate, it was um, put and uh, uh, formulated in certain uh, words and in certain mechanisms which are at until now the most practical ways so they want a sort of combination between this and their religious system and they do not find in any democratic process uh, something against their religion so there is now a sort of trend which tries to combine uh, the best of the western political culture and the values of Islam. All right, help me out in a little history here, Professor. Uh, there was something called the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt, founded by? Al-Banna. Okay, and that spread to other Arab countries. And then there was something else called Jama'a Islami, Islami. and yes. that was founded by? Al-Mawdudi. Okay, and this was in the Indian subcontinents. Yes. Uh, they're both seen as main representatives of modern Islamic activism. Can you right now uh, underline their main goals, means, and differences? Well, um, there, there is common ground and there are differences. The common ground, of course, was that they wanted to restore the Islamic identity in the social and the political arena. That Islam is not individually practiced by every individual in his or her own way. It should be practiced by the whole society uh, not in the sense of uh, rituals or prayers or something, but in the sense of certain virtues, certain values directing the whole society and the whole country, the whole state. So this is the common grounds, but it happened, of course, that um, uh, Maududi in India addressed mainly the educated people. India is a very, very big subcontinent country and it's, it's different to have a populous mo movement going to, herb, to uh, rural areas and so on. So he addressed the educated people, the students and the educated people, the bureaucracy and all these people, and concentrated himself, focused on them. While Albanna tried to make a populous um, uh, movement, he went through rural areas, through villages, through uh, and in addition to universities and so on. So this is uh, the difference. But uh, one of the main things, of course, between uh, both were, were um, oriented or directed against foreign occupation. But within, inside the country itself, I feel that the Muslims in Egypt having um, a smaller country and the smoother relations with the non-Muslims, it was more tolerant or more receptive to a sort of joint relations with the non-Muslims, while al-Mawdudi was a little bit strict and suspicious about the relations with the Hindus and so on. 
So he insisted on a Muslim state and, and all these uh, requirements in a strict way. With regard to gender also, he considered many things uh, with regard to women were just a Western product and were uh, exported to Muslim countries through the Western occupations. So he was more suspicious, not against the education of women or something, but religious education, Islamic education, um, and to a sort of uh, restrictiveness, I don't say, say restrictions, but restrictiveness uh, as an attitude in uh, the activities of women in uh, mixing with men in something like this. So these newly formed Muslim states had different and varying relationships with the former colonial people or the West in general. Uh, and in terms of that, how, how were their goals achieved? Well, with relations, with regard to the relation with the Western occupiers, I think all of them were against this sort of occupation. The, the difference is between probably the secularist uh, leadership, which came through the struggle for independence and they ruled after independence. These uh, were more confident in adopting all the patterns of uh, Western secularism while the masses, of course, wanted to stick to their roots. But with regard to uh, the internal policies of every organization in its country, I think it was, uh, of course, uh, concerned or it was directed according to the internal circumstances. And uh, some considered in, in, in India, for example, was the, the main goal would be uh, keeping the Muslim identity from the Hindus or working with the Hindus against the British. And accordingly, should we have one state, one Indian state after independence, or we should have two states, one for the Muslims and the other for the Hindus? This was, uh, diff th these were different concerns. And accordingly, what prevailed is the partition and the having Pakistan separate from um, India and then Pakistan was split into Pakistan and Bangladesh. While in Egypt this was not ra raised at all, that Christians and Muslims should have separate states. They should have one state and the relations, they are one nation and they should be equal and so on. So there were differences according to uh, internal circumstances, but the main thing is to maintain the Islamic values in the social and political life. Let's talk about the Islamic regime reached in Iran, which was sort of a people's movement up from the bottom, grassroots. And the Islamic regime in Sudan, which was reached from the top down, military coup. Two different ways of reaching Islamic State. But the question is, are they both or different characteristics or representations of, say, on one hand, Iran or Shiite attitude, or an Arab, Sudanese, and or Sunni attitude? Well, uh, that's a good question. I may say that um, it is difficult to, to generalize, to say that this is a pattern for Sunnis or Arabs or, and this is a general pattern for Shi'is or Iranians. But I may say that, for example, in Sudan, um, before the last movement, which brought this military regime from above or from uh, the top, there was a movement from the grassroots, from below, against the military regime under Numeri and they restored the democracy and uh, political parties and so on. So in Sudan itself, it um, witnessed sometimes a movement from below, from the grassroots, and sometimes a movement from the top, from the military, just in a very short period in the last two decades. Um, but we should, saying this, and it is difficult, of course, that all the Shi'is 